Hi, and welcome to the video for section 4.7 uh, for Math 181. This is the first of two videos. In this section, we kind of change it up a little bit from what we've been doing the last few sections. So the last few sections, we've been uh, looking at max and mins, concavity, sketching graphs, things of that nature. In this section, we're going to be talking what's uh, talking about what's known as the antiderivative. And this is actually pretty important in terms of the last chapter of the semester here, chapter five, which is integrals. Uh, we're going to be applying this antiderivative quite a bit. So with a lot of what we do in math, there's always like the reversing process, right? Like we can square a number and then take the square root, or we could take the natural log of a number and then take E, and they kind of cancel each other out, reverse the process. Well, as the name implies, antiderivative, that's what we're going to be doing. So up until this point, we had a function and we've been finding the derivative of it. Now we're going to be given some function, take the antiderivative and find out what was the original function that led to that function we were given. So formally, a definition is a function f. And notice here now, this is a capital F. When we're talking about the main, the starting function, it's a little f. The function, the derivative function, is capital F. So the function, capital F, is called an antiderivative. Of F little f on interval i if <clears throat> f prime of x is equal to the original function f for all x in that interval i. So, what is this thing really saying? So i.e., let's say we let f of x equal x squared. In that case, big F of x would have to be one-third x to the third. And why is that? Well, because by the definition, if I take the derivative of this guy, so f prime of x is what? Bring down the 3 and multiply it. That's 1x subtract 1 squared, which is our starting function f. So this antiderivative function is going to be the one that if I take the derivative of it, gives us the main function back. This leads us to our first theorem in this section. So theorem 1 says the following, if f is an antiderivative of, so if capital F is an antiderivative of little f, on the interval i, then the most general antiderivative of f is capital F of x plus c, where c is an arbitrary constant. And I'm actually going to switch this up here. I'm going to write this c in red and underline it. Reason being is that as you guys are doing some of the homework, hopefully not on the exam making this mistake, but you'll put in an answer and it'll say wrong. And it's because you're forgetting this constant. 
Why do we have to put this C there? Well, let's look at the following. I shouldn't erase that. So let's say we still have this. F of x is 1 third x to the third. And f of x is equal to x squared. Well, now, what if I have f of x, let's call it star to signify a different, is 1 third x to the third plus 1. If I now take the derivative of that x star function, what do I get? I get again x squared. Why? Because the constant on the end, when I take the derivative, is going to go to 0. So no matter what I put here, plus or minus any constant value, when I take its derivative, it's going to give me the function f. So that's why we're saying it's the most general antiderivative. It's that f of x plus some constant c. Because we don't know if there's a number on there or not. And we'll see in some examples down the road here how to figure out if there is or not or what that specific value would be. But that's why we need to put that value of c on there. So how do we find these antiderivatives? What are the process or do we have any shortcuts? And the answer is yes, a little bit. So some of the basics So I'm just going to build a little table here. So I have function and then it's antiderivative. So if I have x to some power n. So in this last example we had what? We had f of x was x squared and so the antiderivative function was what? One third x to the third. Remember what I said to start with, this antiderivative is what? It's the reversing of the process. So when I was taking the derivative of a function, what did I do? I took the, number, the exponent, multiplied it by the uh, coefficient, and then subtracted 1. So to reverse the process, what do I have to do? I have to add 1 and now divide the coefficient by that new exponent. So if I'm given some function, if I'm, if I'm told, uh, whatever, f of x is, well, let me just put down the basics, and then we'll see some examples here. So if I'm given some function, and I need to find the antiderivative, what I'm going to do is add 1 to the exponent, and then divide the whole thing by whatever that new exponent is. What if I have 1 over x? So now let's think about this. What function did I have that if I took the derivative, it gave me 1 over x? And that was what? That was the natural log function. But what if I had natural log of minus x? When I took that derivative, it would be 1 over minus x. Using the chain rule, times negative 1 gives me positive 1 over x. So I need to account for the fact that I'm not sure if it's a plus or minus x inside the parentheses. So if we have 1 over x, the antiderivative is natural log of the absolute value of x. What about e to the x? So what function did I have that if I took the derivative, I got e to the x? Well, it's the same thing, right? So if I have e to the x, I take the derivative, I get e to the x. And then if I have some function f of x and some function g of x, this antiderivative is going to be f of x, capital F of x, plus capital G of x. Point being here that, let's say I have a polynomial. Uh, x to the fourth plus x to the third plus two. So I have a bunch of pieces that are added together, or minus two, doesn't matter, plus or minus. All I'm going to be doing is taking the antiderivative of each piece and then adding them up at the end, and that gives me the antiderivative. And so actually, there's a full table of these guys. 
So it's these few I gave you here, and then it's a bunch more, um, primarily the trig function. So the full table is on page 249. And again, it's primarily the trig functions. It's, you know, if I have sine, then it's got to be minus cosine. If I have cosine, then it's got to be sine. So again, it's, I know some of you have sort of like a cheat sheet or a printout of the derivatives of functions. So you're just going to look on the right side, find out, oh, okay, this matches here. So that would have been my base function. Go back to the one on the left of the equal sign. So that's it. Pretty quick video to start here. Kind of introduce you to what is the idea of the antiderivative. It's essentially the reversing of the process to find that original function. Come on back. Uh, video two, we're just going to work a bunch of examples, kind of get comfortable with the concept. So once we get into chapter five, it's a little easier to process through.